At no juncture does any statute in the law permit prosecutors or evidence technicians to destroy a rape kit two weeks after a conviction. Doesn't happen. Scott is one of the most tragic cases, but he's not the only tragic case. How does a jury of 12 people get this wrong? They couldn't pick the right guy because they were never given the right guy to pick. So they picked the only guy that they were given, not the guy they should have picked. He couldn't fit any evidence to fit Scotty. So he changed Scotty to fit the evidence. I'm going to be 100% open, 100% honest, Kyle. I'm here and been here for 33 years for something I, I did not do. By the time you get to know me and hear my story, you're going to know I didn't do it. I appreciate you meeting with me today. Um, following up on an interview that I've done on behalf of Scott McMillan with his wife, and I understand that you represent or assist Scott McMillan with some of his legal strategy. Absolutely. Okay. What I wanted to get from you to today is just the understanding of how you came into contact with Scott and the nature of uh, the work that you do. Uh, well, I'm a certified paralegal. I was incarcerated with Scott at the uh, Chippewa Correctional Facility. We became bunkies. Didn't hit it off right away. Um, you know, just two men trying to figure out a small space uh, wasn't really uh, an egregious situation, just wasn't necessarily a friendly one. Uh, at some point, we reconciled our differences and learning that I was a certified paralegal, Scott asked me to look at his case. I looked at his case. At the time, he was trying to get back in court under uh, a particular statute on a de facto life sentence because he was sentenced to 80 to 150 years plus life. And Judge Mester at the time of sentencing stated, there shall be no parole in this case. So that basically made it a de facto life sentence. And under Graham versus Florida, being a 17-year-old and uh, having a non-homicide case, which is what Graham speaks to, Scott should have been let go on that. His lawyer had sent him back to court under the wrong statute in the wrong cases. And that's how I got involved to speak with his lawyer to give him the proper information in order to get Scott back in court, which was James Sterling Lawrence at the time, I had spoken with him on the phone. He admitted that he did use the wrong statutes and that I was right, but he wanted to charge Scott again to fix his own mistake. And so instead of doing that, I've been working with him ever since trying to get him back home. One of the things that you just mentioned there that really stuck out to me was the duration of his sentence. That sounds ridiculous, particularly for a crime where no one died. Um, what does it say to you when you hear a sentence that sounds so disproportionate going out well, to a 17 year old? It, 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 it says to me that the judge in this case wanted to ensure that this 17 year old would die in prison. Uh, you had cases like Miller versus Alabama, uh, Graham versus Florida, you had uh, Montgomery versus Louisiana, and all these cases speaks to juveniles and their lack of culpability based on their mental capacities. So when you say that a 17 year old is irredeemable at the onset without ever giving him the opportunity for rehabilitation and growth within the judicial system, within the prison system itself, you're kind of uh, throwing him away before all the verdicts are in. And so we're talking about why did Fred Master have this type of um, 
I don't even know what you call it because only he knows in his mind exactly why he did what he did. But I will say this. Scott's co-defendants went before Judge Coon. Scott should have also went before Judge Coon. One of the individuals who uh, pled guilty to raping this victim only got eight years. But they were sentenced by Judge Coon and not by Judge Mester. How Judge Mester acquired jurisdiction over this case is still a mystery because the chief judge never assigned him uh, this case. And because the two co-defendants went before Judge Coon, there was no order of separation. So all three defendants should have had the same judge. Fred Mester singled Scotty out, acquired this case because he wanted to exact the type of justice that he exacted in this case. One of the themes that I see developing here is people all along the way, representatives of the justice system, failing Scott at different points. Can you explain how someone who's a 17 year old going into a case with this, you know, going into a, a prosecution of a very serious crime. Absolutely. But can become susceptible to the type of situation where he gets, you know, a hundred plus years as an innocent person, but somebody with him, you know, gets eight years when they're objectively guilty. How does that happen? And, and how many ways can the well, justice- it, it happens because the justice system didn't look at this case from a unbiased perspective. Like I said, Judge Mester acquired the case because he wanted the case. I'm not sure if that was because he had a preconceived understanding of what this case entailed, but we're dealing with a 14 year old, sometimes they say 13 year old, but I think she was actually 14 years old. But we're talking about a white victim, a white 14 year old girl, and you're talking about several black males. So already there's a disparage in the justice system that we're not gonna allow you to treat us that way. And when you have that kind of mentality going in, it's easy to get caught up in the justice system the way it's designed because, you know, a lot of times we say it's broken. A lot of times we say it doesn't work, but it works exactly the way that it was designed to work. It, you know, we coming out of the heels of Jim Crowism and the civil rights, et cetera, et cetera. And we all know those stories. And so when you have this 14 year old white girl that's been brutally raped and nobody's taken away from her situation because she was absolutely a victim. She just was not Scott McMillan's victim. There were other individuals in the house who did violate and rape this woman, but from the onset, the investigation was not undertook in the manner that it should have been because one of the persons who touted himself as being her savior, uh, her rescuer coming to get her out of the house was Andre Jones. Andre Jones was a person who the victim herself Although she did not identify Scotty in three subsequent lineups, she never identified Scotty in court. When asked if that was the person who raped her, she said, he's supposed to be right there. Well, he's supposed to be intimates and indicates that somebody told her Scott was the guy that raped her. Because if they didn't tell her that, then why would she say, He's supposed to be right there. That language is key. She testified on several occasions that Andre Jones was the fourth person she had sex with. She testified that she gave oral sex to Andre Jones, and yet Andre Jones was never investigated. Andre Jones was never charged. Andre Jones did affidavits on Scotty's behalf stating that Scotty never got off the couch, that
that Scotty never participated in this rape. And we know now why Andre Jones knew that is because when the DNA was tested 34 years later, it came back to Andre Jones. So this is a huge point that you're bringing us to here. 34 years later, we now have DNA evidence. What can we conclude from that DNA evidence? And why in the hell did it take so long for it to be brought up? The, the reason why it took so long, well, the, the issue with Andre Jones never came up until the DNA proved that it was his semen deposit that was left in the victim. But yet the statute of limitations have ran. So Andre Jones still won't be charged, even though now we know he's the actual person who raped this victim. It took so long because Scotty was found guilty based on the fact that he was a non-secretor. When they initially did the rape kit and took these vaginal slides, they didn't have the kind of DNA STR testing that they have today. So what they said was, is that because Scott McMillan was a non-secretor, he could not be excluded as the person who left this DNA sample. Now, they didn't say he emphatically did it. They didn't say that the DNA sample proved that he was the depositor. They only said that he could not be excluded and because he was a non-secretor and because the person who left the sample was a non-secretor, it was wrongfully believed that he was that person. The so it sounds like they started his case off from the point of maybe a presumption of guilt. Oh, rather absolutely. Than absolutely from a presumption of guilt, for sure. But they destroyed the rape kit in this case two weeks after his conviction. So these slides that were at the Michigan State Police evidence room, mm -hmm. Lori Montgomery, after getting this case some 34 years, 33 and some months later, 33 years and a few months later, was the person who went and found these slides in the evidence room. Now, we have to remember, or I should bring up the point that Judge Fred Mester, the same person who sentenced Scotty to 80 to 150 years and life with a stipulation that no parole shall be granted, ordered a retesting of the DNA evidence over 10 years ago. That DNA evidence was never produced. It was told to not exist. And so Scotty probably could have gotten the result or absolutely would have gotten the result 10 years ago had that DNA been tested as ordered by the sentencing judge, but he was erroneously told no DNA evidence existed, that the rape kit had been destroyed, and therefore there was nothing left of a biological nature to be tested according to his order. So basically, his key piece of evidence to exonerate him was totally inaccessible to him. Is somebody responsible for that? Does somebody have to be accountable for you know that these this time lost, or is that only effective if he is able to have success getting out? Well, I think I think uh, there's a lot of people who are responsible for the negligence and how Scotty's case was handled. If Lori Montgomery was able to go to the state police department evidence room and find these slides, somebody prior to her should have been able to and could have been able to also find these slides. They could have submitted this evidence to the court 10 years ago when Fred Mester ordered that evidence, somebody didn't look good enough for this evidence. Lori Montgomery from the Criminal Integrity Unit and from the Attorney General's office went down and found this evidence. So that means that this evidence had always been accessible. It's just nobody wanted to access it. Nobody wanted to go and find due, to due diligence to find this evidence 
so that we would know whether or not this individual should be convicted based on the flimsy DNA evidence which they presented at court. Not being excluded doesn't mean that you are the person who left the sample. That's got to be clear. Okay, it's a blessing that we found this evidence, that Lori Montgomery found this evidence. But the sad part is after Lori Montgomery found this evidence, had this DNA tested, this DNA evidence tested, found that now 30 three, almost 34 years later, Scott McMillan is 100% excluded from being the person who left this deposit. Nobody took this evidence to the court and said, hey, maybe we got the wrong guy. Nobody took this evidence to the courts. That brings me to the next question concerning the DNA. Now that we have it, what is the next step to getting Scott out? The next step is we just prepared a, what's called a motion for relief from judgment. It's a 6.502 G2 motion based on newly discovered DNA evidence. So it overcomes the procedural hurdle and it forces the court to now look at this new evidence, which has been tested and retested to confirm the original results that Sherwin Scott McMillan has been 100% excluded as being the person who left this DNA sample inside the victim. And not only did it confirm that when that sample or that profile that was generated was ran through CODIS, it came back emphatically that Andre Jones, the person who touted himself as being the victim's savior was actually the victim's rapist. Let me ask you this. For the people who helped get the DNA evidence, right. once they got the results, are they under any kind of obligation to do anything with that material? We would On believe, Scott's behalf. We would believe that the attorney general's office now being in possession of this information, had an obligation to bring as an agent of the court, had an, had an opportunity and a responsibility to bring this new DNA evidence to the court to inform the court that where this individual was convicted because he was a non-secretor and it was presumed that he was guilty, that now this evidence, the same evidence that convicted him, exonerates him. And so I would say, yes, they had an obligation to bring this information to the court. At the time that this DNA evidence was uncovered, we can't say discovered because it was already there. Can you speak to some of the other burdens that you've seen Scott and his family suffer at the hands of people who were just apparently not as enthusiastic about defending him as you are? Well, I, 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 I've watched um, James Sterling Lawrence, as I said, was his lawyer, filed a brief on his behalf under the wrong statutes, then wanted to charge him additional monies in order to correct his own mistakes, had no compassion for Scott and his plight whatsoever, only wanted some money. After that happened, I, I watched uh, Sheldon Helpburn another attorney, promised Scott he knew the lawyer, I mean, he knew his judge, he would be able to step in, he would be able to get him some relief and filed a frivolous 2.119 reconsideration motion that was immediately shot down. And so that was just another uh, build up for a letdown and an extraction of money from this family before hiring another lawyer, they gave me what was necessary to get the motion done. And, it, and it's not easy, but I got it done and we're filing it as we speak. 
And based on the fact that it's newly discovered evidence, that the evidence speaks for itself, can't really see the court turning a blind eye to this new evidence and denying us because it's not me speaking, it's not Scott speaking, it's the evidence that's speaking. And the evidence is screaming, Scott didn't do this. Let's, let's, let's touch on a couple things. One, Kenneth Briggs, who testified against his brother, Michael Briggs, who was actually the person who brought the victim to the home. Kenneth Briggs was one of the only people who said that he saw Scotty getting oral sex from the victim. The victim herself said she didn't give or Scotty oral sex. The victim herself said she couldn't even identify Scott as being one of the individuals and emphatically stated on several occasions that she believed Andre Jones was the fourth person she had sex with and that she was giving oral sex to Andre Jones. So when we talk about how this is an epic failure, the only reason why Scott was the only person who was a non-secretor at that home that night is because Andre Jones was never tested. Had he been tested, that would have raised a reasonable doubt because now Scotty would not have been the only non-secretor. The actual rapist was a non-secretor and that was Andre Jones. But because he was never tested, then there was only one person who was identified as being a non-secretor. And if you only have one person identified as being a non-secretor, you think erroneously that this is your person. But that only happened because Andre Jones was never tested. When we talk about other checks and balances that could have been put in place and should have been put in place, the rape kit never should have been destroyed. The rape, should, the rape kit should have been kept on file for at least 10 to 15 years until all Scotty's appeals had been exhausted. At no juncture does any statute in the law permit prosecutors or evidence technicians to destroy a rape kit two weeks after a conviction. Doesn't happen. So that was another failure. And when Lori Montgomery and the Criminal Integrity Unit found that this DNA didn't belong to Scott, part of that name says integrity. So there had to be some integrity on behalf of the Attorney General's office and on behalf of Laurel K. Young and on behalf of Lori Montgomery to say, we need to be the people who bring this issue to the court because we need to show some integrity on Scott's behalf. 33 and a half years, as you stated in the opening, for a non-homicide is tragic enough, but for a non-homicide that you didn't commit, you didn't even commit the rape, that's more than enough. That's well, beyond excessive. It seems like there's some shit in the game. It seems like you know there's something conspiratorial, if you will. Is it premature for a listener like me to assume that? And if not, if it ain't conspiratorial, if it ain't something, you know, somebody no, it, could it's tell. a it's absolutely not premature because we're talking about almost 34 years without some sense of justice being exacted in this case. This guy came up for uh, review under Graham versus Florida in 2010. You know, this person came up for review when Judge Messer ordered that DNA evidence to be located. And if it's not conspiratorial, why wasn't that DNA evidence located when the judge ordered it to be located? How could Lori Montgomery later, 10 years or so later, 12 years almost, come back and find this evidence? And, and is it safe to say that had some people known that these vaginal slides still existed, that they would not have destroyed those as well? 
I think it's highly conspiratorial to watch a man. You got to have some compassion for a guy. And then you had an adult. You had an adult associated with this case pled guilty to raping this victim, both vaginally and orally. And he got eight years. How old was this guy? I don't really know his age. Um, that's the one element I don't know, but I know he was an adult. Okay. I know he was in his early 20s. And I know he got eight years. Okay. And I know that Andre Jones, who was the actual person who left the semen deposit in this victim, who emphatically raped her and forced himself on her orally, walked the streets for 34 years as an unconvicted rapist. How many other people did he do it to or had the opportunity to do it to because that was his nature? And then to sit back and stay close to the case, pretend to be Scotty, pretend to be Scotty's friend, write affidavits on his behalf as if you're trying to get him out when all along you knew the semen belonged to you because you know you performed the act. So if Andre Jones submitted an affidavit saying that he saw Scotty on the couch all night, that Scotty did not participate in this rape, who better to make that assessment than one of the rapists himself? Who better to make that assessment? You know, Scott, thought he did see somebody having sex with the victim. He was 17, sitting on a couch, inebriated. He didn't know who it was. He thought it was another guy. He offered that it might come back to that guy. And because it didn't come back to who he said it would come back to, they crucified him for that. Well, he's not a police investigator. He was 17 and inebriated. He's not supposed to, as a 50-something-year-old man, remember every detail of a rape he didn't participate in. So to hold him to that standard and to shift the burden on him to find who actually did the rapes in order to exonerate himself is mean and unjust. It's not his responsibility. You got the DNA. You ran that DNA through CODIS. You know who actually left that deposit. You know that person was a non-secretor. At the very best, you know that Scott's jury heard erroneous testimony about a vaginal rape and about him being linked to this case because he was a non-secretor. That evidence in and of itself was tainted and therefore affords him a new trial. Going forward, what resistance, if any, do you see on the horizon for your motion? I see individuals like you creating a platform where people can hear the truth about this situation. One of the things that we've done in this modern age of social media is that people like to tune in to good stories. And we're able to reach people all across the globe. And so I think venues and forums like this one that gives an opportunity for his story to be told and for individuals like me to be able to help tell that story is a remarkable uh, uh, feat. And I don't think anybody trying to do anything to discourage further the truth from coming out will be successful at this point. I can only hope so. I can only hope so. I don't have any further questions for you at the moment. Do you have anything you'd like to close with? I would. I would, I would just like to close by saying thank you. I know the work that you and Cynthia have been doing to bring attention to this plight, and it's very laudable and necessary. We need help. We need uh, help in all areas, you know, because especially financial, the, the justice system is not free. You know, we, they, they lock us up for free, but they make us pay to get out. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times we can't overcome the financial hurdles. I, I sympathize because 
Scott's wife, Tangie, who's a beautiful woman who has been in his corner from day one, who has believed in him. You got to remember in prison, carrying the stigma of being a child molester is one thing. Being a child molester of somebody under the age of 14 or 14 is worse. Being a black man accused of molesting a white girl is even worse still. And Scotty has had to carry all these burdens unjustly. And, and so, he, and, and, and so he I still say, had to throw away thousands and thousands of dollars on the way. Absolutely. And so my, my plight is to, you know, not just get recognition for this family, but to get some help. 34 years, if, if an individual, and I won't even use Scotty as an example, but if an individual was guilty of this crime, 34 years still would have been enough because nobody got killed. And that's not to diminish the suffering that this child went through, but she's gone on to live a productive life. Kenneth Briggs, the person who lied on Scotty, was basically adopted by Judge Fred Master, was placed in a good home, and was given a great life, even though he lied to take Scotty's life away from him. And so how should you enjoy your life from that perspective when you're destroying another man's life erroneously? You know that this guy is innocent, yet you've gone on and nobody has compassion all these years later to say, you know what? Maybe we got this wrong. Kenneth Briggs, no, he got it wrong. The victim in this case knew she couldn't identify uh, Scotty, but she was traumatized as a 14 year old with four men raping her. So I would never hold anything against her because this was her tragedy to try to explain. But when she says, I had sex with Andre Jones, I gave oral sex to Andre Jones, police, prosecutors, and everybody else within earshot was supposed to listen to her, go get Andre Jones, test Andre Jones, and maybe we wouldn't be here talking about Scott McMillan being in prison for 34 years. So, if anything I can close with is that Scott is one of the most tragic cases, but he's not the only tragic case. We need to look into a lot of these cases where individuals are being wrongfully convicted. And one of the statistics shows that of 75% or higher of individuals who were released from death row because of DNA evidence, also had eyewitness, eyewitnesses in their cases. So Michigan knows, the United States of America knows, the case law supports that eyewitness testimony is inherently unreliable, inherently unreliable. So to take Kenneth Briggs's word over the word of the victim herself and over the word of the defendant, and over the word of the evidence speaks volumes as to how this case went awry. But that brings me to one last point. Gregory Townsend, who was the prosecutor in this case, when he, he changed his narrative from the cases he prosecuted with Leotis Carr and Michael Briggs, he came with a different narrative when he prosecuted Scotty, he couldn't fit Scotty, he couldn't fit any evidence to fit Scotty, so he changed Scotty to fit the evidence and had individuals identify Scotty as being boss daddy Kane, somebody he was never identified as being, and somebody who was purported to have raped the victim. He tried to make Mike uh, Kenneth Briggs identifies Scotty because when he asked him, he's like, what do you know him by? He says, Scott or Scotty. He said, you don't know him as boss daddy Kane? He said, oh yeah, and boss daddy. So really? he made Scott into 
who he wanted and needed him to Objection be. Objection leading. <laughs> led. Led. So I'm and assuming it's, it's Gregory yeah. Townsend is a prosecutor who's still in good standing? Gregory Townsend, Townsend is a prosecutor who has been uh, excommunicated from the prosecutorial world. He was kicked out of the uh, uh, attorney general's office. There has been five cases overturned where he maliciously and wrongfully prosecuted individuals by uh, messing with the evidence, et cetera. And he happens to be the same prosecutor in this case and had done the same thing to Scotty. So when we look at Gregory Townsend himself, we know that any verdict reached by a jury in this case cannot be relied upon because the jury was unlawfully misled by Gregory Towns. I have to ask you this. How does a jury of 12 people get this wrong? I, you know, when we talk about beyond a reasonable doubt, if there was one sample and then you offered up two non-secretors, even if you couldn't get a DNA profile at that time, which one of the non-secretors left the sample? Well, the victim said she had sex with Andre Jones, and the victim said she gave oral sex to Andre Jones. So if there were two non-secretors present, Scott McMillan and Andre Jones, who do you think the jury would have picked then? They couldn't pick the right guy because they were never given the right guy to pick. So they picked the only guy that they were given, not the guy they should have picked. And to this day, Scott McMillan is still in prison because of these failures. And, and today, Scott McMillan is still in prison because of these failures. And we pray that your audience chimes in. We've done interviews with other people like Arthur Woodson, who out of Flint, who's doing a remarkable job to try to help Scotty. Uh, uh, his friend Tree, I forget Tree's name right now, uh, Tony Roy. Tony Roy out of Flint is uh, trying to help Scotty. Uh, Janelle Allen Bay is trying to help Scotty. So people are coming on board. People are looking at this case. People are now saying, wait a minute, something is emphatically wrong with this conviction. And so like the great work that you're doing, like the great work that Cynthia is doing, I think we're going to get enough people to look. And I don't want you to listen to me. I don't want you to believe me. I want you to look at the evidence and I want you to believe the evidence. I'm biased. I know what it speaks to. I want to get him home. But the evidence in this case, the DNA, which now says Sir and Scott McMillan has been 100% excluded, begs you to release him. Not me. Not all of us who are fighting for his behalf. We just want people to step up and take notice of the evidence and say, with this evidence, why is this guy still in prison? Thank you, Mr. Bay. I appreciate it. While it's on my mind, let me ask you this. I have in front of me the, uh, the DNA reports. Is there any of that that's extremely relevant that I, that I need to put my eye on when I can you know, read through this and consider it? Well, when you when you, you you need to, we don't really. I'm gonna. Uh, it says the STR profile generated from the epithelial fractions uh, F1 of DNA sample vag, which is a vaginal sample, is consistent with a mixture of a major female, and we know that to be the victim contributor, and the male contributor of the STR profile generated from the sperm fraction F2 or DNA sample bag. Sherwin Scott McMillan is excluded as the contributor of the STR profile generated from the sperm fraction F2 of DNA sample bag. So that was the male profile. Scott was excluded as being the person who left that profile and once that profile was generated, ran through CODIS, Andre Jones was identified as being the male who left that profile. So the victim testified she had sex 
with these guys in the same way. And everybody who penetrated her, she also gave oral sex to. So by Scott being wrongfully presumed to have had vaginal sex, he was automatically assumed to have had oral sex. So now that we know he didn't have vaginal sex, we can presume that he didn't have oral sex either. He wasn't uh, convicted on any evidence of oral. It was presumed that because he might have been the person who left the vaginal sample, that he also had oral sex as well. It doesn't get much clearer than this. Absolutely. So when one goes away, they both go away. 